money for me growing up, like I remember I used to get really excited when I was in high school and it was Tuesday because Tuesday when I was with my dad, he would go to McDonald's and like cheeseburgers were like 39 cents or something. <laughs> and he would get like 10 cheeseburgers. And on special occasions, he would get an order of a large fry. Um, and like, that was like a big deal. So like, that's what I grew up with. This was the house that my dad couldn't afford to buy. It was an $8,000 home. And he had to borrow the money from his ex-wife, my mom, uh, just to put to, to buy this house. And that was that's what I remember growing up. Like my, I never had steaks on the grill. Uh, eating good, like I used to eat Totino's pizzas and ramen noodles. Like what I grew up like eating for like most of my life. And somehow I stumbled into becoming a financial advisor, <laughs> and the rest became history. But um, man, there's like so many life moments, but. As I got older, the one I shared the most, I think, is so quick backstory. Both my parents, they divorced when I was young. I think I was like three or four years old. So divorced, and they both filed bankruptcy not once but twice. So that's four times total. Like, I don't know how they actually pulled that off. It's quite a miracle. And, like, that's what – that's the type of financial lessons, like, I, I was taught. And remember, I was – I think I was – I just started becoming a financial advisor – and when flat screen TVs were the new thing, and I'm totally dating myself here. Um, <laughs> and I won a 42 inch flat screen because that was like the, the big one, right? Big. And I was making like 20 grand a year, still had student loan credit card debt, but man, I wanted it and I felt like I deserved it. And I told my dad, I was like, man, I really love this TV. And it's like, you know what? You should go open up a 0% credit card at Best Buy and you can get yourself a TV. And like that was the advice he told me. And I'm like, yes, you're absolutely right. I should totally do that. And I ran up by my girlfriend, which ended up being my wife. I ran up by her, and she's like, you can't afford that. Like, why? what are you thinking? I remember I was so angry that she she told me no. Um, but uh, I listened. I, I slept on it, didn't buy the TV. And that was just kind of like my dad's mantra, right? Like, if you can't afford it, just charge it. And I remember my mom, the second time I think she filed bankruptcy, I remember she went on a shopping spree. And they even took me with her to buy stuff. Because that's when you could buy stuff and like just keep it all, and so yeah, that's what I grew up with. Um, so that walk down memory lane, that's some of the financial lessons I grew up with. The uh, the, the cheeseburger story definitely brings a smile to my face because I definitely remember those days. Those and Taco Bell would also do like twenty nine cent tacos. Oh yeah, and we just like come back with the, with a stack of them. Um, <laughs> yes. So when you're when you're growing up like that, and both parents are you know, both kind of seem to have a similar sentiment towards money. I could imagine like it's possible that you thought that's like normal. And I'm just curious if did you realize in the moment that they had such a problem with money or was it not until later when you could kind of look back and be like, oh, my goodness, like most people don't actually go bankrupt like this is not normal. You know, like if there is one blessing in it. So my mom, she ended up remarrying and, and my stepdad, who I, I just had, you know, he, <laughs> I just had a lot of resentment towards him, right? I mean, because he was like trying to replace my dad. But the one thing that he did offer was, I don't know what he did, but he was in sales. And my dad, like he peaked out making, I think like $45,000 a year. Um, so like that was his peak salary. Whereas my stepdad, I remember like he had like the car phone when like back phones were the thing, right? Um, he had like an, Ale basically like an Alexa back like in the early 90s or late 80s. It never worked, but it was still kind of cool. You know, you'd walk in. I forgot. Oh, it was Butler. Hey, Butler, do this. It never worked. But anyway, like he had all <laughs> like, so I had this exposure. He didn't have like a big house or anything, but like he drove a Cadillac and, but he had some nicer things that I just wasn't used to. So at least it kind of opened my eyes to like, Hey, there's, there's something different here than like what I'm seeing with my dad, because with him and his family, I mean, they, they were, I would say middle class or below middle class. And for the most part, living in a small town, like around 8,000 people, they're just, I wasn't really exposed to millionaires and, and wealthy people. And it really wasn't until later on when I think I just started reading some books and getting some exposure to that, where I started like realizing, hey, there's something here that I'm completely oblivious to. And fast forwarding a bit to when you became a financial advisor and during the first few years of your financial advisorship, were you a good steward of your money or were you just like being a financial advisor? Because I know we've had people on the show before who were financial advisors for a decade, but they were like living paycheck to paycheck while they're telling other people what they should invest in and what they should do with their money. Yeah, no. So like when I started, 
my career, I had like $30,000 of credit card debt. Uh, I'm sorry, student loan debt, which I shouldn't have had because I joined the Army National Guard to pay for college, but still so that took out student loans to fund my college lifestyle and had credit card debt. I even co-signed for my ex-girlfriend, had a $10,000 like Discover card. <laughs> Thank God that she <laughs> paid that off. Um, <laughs> whew, so many, so many things I dodged back in the day. Um, so starting off my career, like I definitely was, I was, and this is really thankful to my wife because she was the one that said, you can't afford this TV. And because for her, like her family didn't have debt. They, they paid, paid for everything in cash for the most part, didn't finance a lot of things. So for her, like this idea of having credit card debt, it kind of scared her, especially if this is the guy she's, was going to marry. So that began this path of like, Hey, let's start to pay off some of that debt. And one of the, the big, uh, things that happened that allowed us to do that was when I was deployed to Iraq, that was like two and a half years into my career. And that's when paid off all the credit card debt paid off. Uh, that's when we started like maxing out Roth IRAs and everything else. But, um, that really helped. So yeah, I was definitely a steward, a better steward with my money, but that's because I had <laughs> had a really good partner uh, that talked some sense into me. Or, I'm sorry, that beat some sense into me. <laughs> I mean, obviously, like being deployed gave you that, you know, that that kind of cash flow to to take out some, uh, you know, to knock out some of these loans and things. But I'm curious if it did anything to also reset your kind of mindset around spending in general. I mean, if you spend 15 months somewhere where basically everything's kind of paid for, right? Like you're not having to pay for housing. The food is there. There's not like, you're not going to the mall. There's not places to go like blow money on. You're getting all the tax exemptions, which helps on that kind of cash flow perspective, but you're also kind of getting out of the habit of just constantly buying things you don't necessarily need. Do you think that that resets some habits for you? Um, I will say, so one of the things I did before I left, I was, if, if, if people are not watching the video, like I started to chuckle because I started having these flashbacks of things that I wanted to buy. And I'll get to that here in one second. But, uh, like I remember I bought a laptop before I was deployed that that, that was something that I needed Two, I had LASIK surgery and I felt like that, that expense was justified because I didn't want to be in combat, you know, in a firefight and all of a sudden like my contact pops out. Um, so like there was some debt that was accrued before I left, um, and for the most part, like our, our, one of our first goals was like pay up our debt and get like $5,000 in savings. Like that was one of our first goals that we had. And then it was max out our Roth IRAs. But after that, you know, we had internet access while we were there. We had a lot of downtime. When you've, after you've worked out like twice in a day, after you played poker for like two or three hours, you know, like after you watched every single movie that God's ever made, like you're bored. And I remember like I was going on eBay and just like looking up things. And I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm laughing so much, but <laughs> so when I was a kid, man, like I love GI Joe's and I love like star Wars and I just have like this appreciation for like those old eighties toys. And I remember like I was wanting to buy like a Boba Fett, like in the package from like 19, whatever year it was created, maybe it was 78, 79. And then I forgot how much it was. It was like a thousand dollars. I'm like, man, we've got the money. And I was trying to convince my wife that I, I need this. She was like, what are you talking about? What are you, why are you trying to buy that? Like, I thought we had these financial goals of like getting savings and doing all this stuff. And you're trying to buy these toys. Um, I should have been a good foreshadowing. So I will say without that, without that trusted partner back then, man, like it would have been so easy to slip back into those ways. So having that accountability partner, just to like ask that question of, do you really need that? Um, fast forward, I still haven't bought the, uh, the Boba Fett, by the way, but I did start buying a lot of sports cards here recently, but anyway, but yeah, so like <laughs> I, I definitely have, because my mantra has always been, oh, I can always make more money, which is, is, can be a good strategy, but like, if that's your strategy, but you keep accruing more credit card debt, like that's when a lot of people get into trouble. But um, for me, it was like we never had debt other than our house. Um, and so it was always like, all right, let's see if we can. What, what can I do to make more money? What new business venture can I do? What new idea can I implement? It was always like a game for me just to see what, what I could basically pull off. So I definitely want to dig into that mantra a bit. And I had a bunch of questions because on Twitter, on YouTube, like you do talk about income generation a lot. And I really like that about you is like there's always more money to be made out there. You can only frugal yourself to zero. At what point in your journey do you start actually taking more control of your income? Because I can imagine as a financial advisor, like you're kind of capped. Like, I don't know whether it was a salary or maybe you made some commissions, but like when did maybe entrepreneurship or other ways of like leveling up your income start to become part of the equation and part of your plan? That's a great question, man. I, looking back, it was, 
You know, I, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and that's that was before becoming an advisor. That was when I was still in college. And the one thing I loved about that book is that that was kind of like my introduction to like, okay, there's something else out here. I really don't know what that is, but I'm very intrigued and inter- interested to find out. So that began that path of like testing out a few MLMs because that was the easy route and realizing that was a waste of time. But let's do another one uh, and and burn some friendships and relationships <laughs> and um, finally moving on. And then it was testing out uh, real estate for a while. Did that for almost like nine months to a year and luckily didn't lose any money other than a lot of time and realized like that just wasn't for me. Uh, I remember I had an idea with this uh, former client of mine that we were going to have a uh, basically like have a marathon where I used to live in Illinois. There was like a basically like a wine country, which is kind of weird to say in Southern Illinois. They, they had like all these different wineries to have like this marathon, like you went running through wine country. I don't even like to run, but yet like I had this, I, this great idea and there's probably 17 other things I can't think of at the moment, but there was always this like intrigue. And I remember the, the advisor that had hired me super successful. He was about maybe 10 years older than me. And he knew like I was trying all these things. I remember he told me, he's like, you know, like you're going to make more money than you ever need just being an advisor. And I'm, I heard that, but there's just something about that. that I'm like, I just couldn't accept it. I don't know, man. It was just like this, this intrigue of like, there's something else out there. And I'm just like curious to see you know, what that is. And eventually that ended up leading into blogging. So it just kind of became this game of like, I just, I just like to test things and try things out and see how it works. You know, you hear about it, you know, like, I, I don't know. That, that just, it was always just like a fun game for me to see if I can test out. And, and turns out I found something that actually worked. Well, as you're, you know, spending some time being a financial advisor, like I'm kind of curious, because in this space, a lot of times that, you know, that persona gets a little demonized. Like people are like, ah, oh, you don't need a financial advisor. They're just trying to take the 1% from you. They're just trying to take these fees from you. In the kind of environment that like when you joined a, as a financial advisor for a company or firm or, or however that was kind of structured, do you feel like that it was predatory at all? I just I think it'd be cool to get a little bit of a, a behind the scenes, like behind the curtain of, of financial advisors for the public who maybe have got that in their head that I absolutely do not need a financial advisor. They add no value, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know how, I know it's changed a lot because I, I was just on an, on an advisor's podcast, actually just like yesterday. And the whole like hourly uh, or annual retainer, like that model didn't really exist like when I started. So think of this. I mean, I'll, I'll let you fill in the fill in the dots here. So starting off, my salary was 18500 Yes, and that was my annual salary. And... <laughs> A client comes in and we're talking about what to do with their investments and I can put them into a fee based account, you know, where I'm getting paid one, one and a half percent for the year, or I could put them in a share mutual funds and make maybe three and a half percent on the load, or I could put them in annuity and get paid five to seven percent. The way the model was structured back then, I mean, the client was set up for failure. And in reality, also the advisor was because there's like, man, I, I have to pay my bills. Like I have to eat like, and, and you tell me there's not a conflict of interest. Like, yeah, there is, there sure is. Um, it became so much easier after you had some stability and didn't have to worry about like, man, how am I going to pay like my rent next month? But in the beginning it, it was, it was hard. And like, I was, there's probably like looking back, there were definitely a few times where I, I leaned towards the, the 7% commission. Because the attraction of like, oh man, last month, because I remember the worst month I had after everything was like $800 for the month, like 800 bucks. And like, man, I just, <laughs> I'm tired of eating Raymond noodles. <laughs> <for God's laughs> sakes. Um, so, you know, like putting it, putting them in like a share mutual funds or, but also too, like that was the, the culture, right? Like that was the Kool-Aid they had to drink that. And you're trusting what you hear. You're trusting all the other advisors, like, you know, all these other guys in my office that, I'm going to them for advice and like, this is what they recommend. I'm like, I don't know any different. Um, so I definitely, the whole like retainer model fee only, I mean, I think that I think obviously is a whole lot better than, than it was back then. Um, so I don't, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a, you, like you said, you're giving a little bit of that look behind the curtain and seeing why maybe some people should watch out for, um, you know, is there a conflict of interest, even though they're fiduciary responsibility, there's still a human being who has to pay the bills. So I think, that's and, I, and I think, and I also think too, right? Like, I think there's like the younger investor, right? There, there's no reason for that person to pay one, one and a half percent 
uh, to an advisor, right? Like you're just saving. I mean, paying somebody hourly, just like, just like you would go see your doctor for a little checkup. I'm like, Hey, just look at my situation. Kind of like I would have with my accountant. We just like review my situation and see if there's anything that I'm missing. You know, just having like a bird's eye view. I think that is totally worth an hour or two of somebody's time. For a lot of my clients were the blue collar folks that had worked their entire life. You know, now they have their nest egg, you know, that they spent their 30 plus years saving. And now they, they're not adding any more money to it. They just don't want to lose it all. And for them, it was just like that peace of mind of knowing that somebody was taking care of it because they had no way. I, I had a lot of people had pensions and they were just putting money in their 401ks and stuff. So for those people, maybe it made more sense. But like for the younger investor, it just, just doesn't make sense. For me, it doesn't make sense to pay that one and one and a half percent just having like an hourly consulting type relationship. I have two questions here. Why was the blog born? I know it sounded like to scratch some of the entrepreneurial itch, but maybe it was a little bit of frustration in that you couldn't give people the best financial advice possible. And then two, just in terms of timeline, when did this, when did the blog happen? Yeah. So the blog happened. So I was with a broker dealer for five years uh, that they ended up selling out and ended up becoming Wells Fargo. And then I went to the independent side, which at the time allowed me to market myself differently, a little bit more uniquely. And that's when, so I'd already like gone through the whole real estate thing, made a few offers, spent a lot of time listening to like these uh, <laughs> before podcasts, you listen to like D or CDs in your car, like infomercial type stuff, Carlton sheets, like real estate riches, I think was what the name of it was. Um, when that didn't work out, so it started, co-founded an investment firm and had this interest in like marketing myself differently. But prior to that, I was doing like seminars. I was doing lunch and learns where I basically would like take people to lunch and just answer their questions on anything that had to do with investing or financial planning. Um, there was like a local park district that I offered like a investing 101 class. And it was just like, just to give education. And a lot of that was all inspired. Once again, going back to my dad of him struggling up until the day that he died with all his debt and recognizing there was this client meeting I had, I think it was like one of the first client meetings I had action. I am client it was a prospect uh, meeting. And it was like the first time that I truly saw like my dad in them and like really saw my dad for who he was financially. But it was this couple, they were in their early sixties and both of them, I think had factory jobs and they hated their jobs and they just wanted to retire. And I'm looking at their, their finances. And I'm like, it ain't going to happen. Like you just don't have enough saved. And I, I, I'll never forget that meeting because what I heard in that meeting was a regret. And the re regret was two things. One, wish they would have saved more, wish they would have started earlier. And, but they didn't have anybody to show them how to do it back in the day. And like, I saw them, I, then I saw my dad. And then all of a sudden, like I saw me in that moment, because like I was doing better with my, my finances, but I don't think I was really like, passionate about saving and investing yet. Like I was still getting, I was just, you know, still green to the whole thing. So it became really passionate. And that moment I'm like, okay, I got to get my acting gear. Otherwise I'm going to be this couple sitting on the other side of the desk talking about these regrets and I need to get my act together. And then two, uh, I have all my, like, I know all my friends, all these people that aren't doing the same thing. And like I, in that moment, like I was inspired to try to help people. So like I was doing everything I could with all these seminars and lunch and learns and investing classes. And then whenever I went independent, discovered blogging, it was like, oh, oh, so I can actually write a blog post and put it on the internet and it can reach hundreds of people. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I was just like blown away because I read this article and keep in mind, like I didn't know what a blog was. Like, that's part of my story. Like I <laughs> read this article about blogging, didn't know what it was. But it was a combination of one, I can market myself, but then two, there was like this potential reach, you know, to like, to impact, as I said, like, when I say hundreds, like I was, that was ambitious for me back then. Um, but that was really just trying to share a lot of my own personal story, like my parents' story and a lot of the client prospect interactions, like a lot of the experience I heard from people like this couple I told you about. And so a couple of things, one, like what year was it when you started the blog? And two, when did it become more in your mind than just like a lead magnet back to your investment firm or this idea that you're going to reach hundreds of people? Like when did it become a much like you realized it's going to be much bigger than what you originally thought? You know, uh, so 2008, uh, I think I bought the domain in July 2008. It was launched and 
You know, I think it was probably like 90 days after it launched. I also had a, a YouTube channel and I put a video on a blog post and this thing was like, the great. I mean, we're talking like non HD webcam, uh, horrible lighting and bad audio. And I was talking about, I think 401k rollover mistakes or something. And I had this on the blog and a couple of days after that, I was contacted by a, uh, some sort of producer from CNBC and they, they flew me out to New Jersey. I got a chance to like audition for the show. I forgot the name of the show. Now, um, I didn't make it on the show. Uh, but then I met like the main producer and then she was the one that gave me the idea for the book, uh, soldier finance. And I share that because I thought I'm, I'm this literally this nobody sitting in my shared office space at the time in Southern Illinois. And I, these people from CNBC found me and flew me out to New Jersey. And I'm like, I'm onto something here. Like there, there's something here that I'm like, I don't even know what it is, but the fact that I put this horrible <laughs> janky video and blog post online and somebody discovered it, um, that was kind of this aha moment of like, okay, there's something bigger here. And just once again, just kept cranking out content, not really having any idea what I'm doing other than like, there's something bigger here than I, I can even understand. If that makes sense. So from a business standpoint, it sounds like at that point, you didn't have any way or you didn't think there was any way to like monetize this audience that you were building. Like, were you thinking about, oh, if I get this number of eyeballs, I'm going to get paid this in ads or like, I'm going to you know get all these people over to my site so I can do affiliate marketing or like, was there any kind of grand monetization scheme going on there? Because like I mentioned earlier, <laughs> you focus a lot now on like increasing income. So was, or was it just like, I've got this cool thing going on. I'm just going to keep on riding this and getting as many people to follow my stuff as possible. Yeah. I, um, so somewhere along the way, um, I, so before Facebook groups, everything else, like there was these blogging, uh, forums that you would go in. So a lot of the guys that like JD Roth was in there and like some of these like old legacy guys. And so in that group, I ended up meeting a guy by the name of Ryan Gana, um, who he, so he was deployed to Iraq the same year I was, he was in the air force and we ended up connecting in this, uh, this forum. And I remember I linked to him. We ended up having a conversation. And so at this time, I've been blogging for like maybe a year. And I'm like, once again, I am clueless, right? I have no idea that you can make money on the internet. Like, I'm sure people do it. But like, all I'm thinking is like Lamborghinis and uh, just all this like really fake internet type stuff, right? And we ended up talking on the phone. And I'll, I'll never forget this because I had a client meeting that was like 45 minutes away. And I was driving back on the interstate. And he shared with me that he had uh, two blogs at the time and he was making $40,000 from his blogs while he was working full time. And I thought, wow, like that's, that's impressive. You know, that you're making that amount from your blogs. Um, but then, then I realized like, oh no, he didn't mean $40,000 a year. He was making $40,000 a month. And that's when I almost ran off the road. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is before hands-free driving and everything. Uh, so like it was that, bit of information that, Ooh, okay. I don't know how, how he's doing that, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Like you, you've got me hooked because at that time it was, it was really weird because we we're about the same age. And I thought like I was, and I was doing very well. Like I was doing very well at that time, income wise, where I was living, cost of living, everything. But then when I realized that he's making that much from his websites, I'm like, Oh wow. Like that, totally like trumps my income. And it sounds like he's working a lot less on that. So it, it was just this intrigue and you kind of throw him and then like Pat Flynn from smart passive income back in the day when he was doing his income reports, like it was just like this kind of this eyes opening of like, Oh wow, there's, there's something else out here that is potentially bigger than what I have going on here with my financial planning practice. I'm glad we got to give Ryan a shout out. Love Ryan. I, I met him uh, several years ago at one of the mil military meetups at FinCon. So he's definitely a great resource. I'm curious, after you kind of started having that conversation, it opens up your mind to what the possibilities are. So now your ceiling is, you know, greatly lifted in your mind. What did you start to do to actually make changes? Like you said, hey, you got me hooked, but what did you do differently to make this like a more serious venture? Yeah. So at that time, like the only thing I could do because I was still, so at that time I still had a series seven securities license 
and my broker dealer was they allowed me to put Google AdSense on my blog, which at the time, I don't think my compliance department really understood what they were approving because here I am. Like I was with LPL Financial. That was the independent broker dealer. They had like 8,000 advisors at the time. No one else had a blog. Like nobody else was trying to put Google AdSense. But if you would have like went to a investing article or retirement article, you would have saw Google ads with ads for Vanguard and Fidelity, which basically is competitors of me and also <laughs> LPL. So they would have like disproved that like w within a heartbeat. Uh, but like that was one. And a lot of people will ask me, well, why, why would you do that? Like, why would you put ads of your competitors on your blog? And like my thought was like, well, okay, if I'm getting a thousand people to come read this one blog post, I don't think every single one of them is going to become my client. You know, so if they truly are interested in working with me, like the ones that are, are interested are going to raise their hand and reach out. The other 999, hopefully they click on an ad, you know, make like a couple bucks. So that was part of it. And I remember like the highest month with Google AdSense was like five grand. And that was after a, like three or four months. Actually, but before that though, it was, uh, <laughs> I don't have it here. It's in my other office, but I still have like a picture of the very first Google AdSense check. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, like the, the amount is like $151 and 97 cents. And I actually regret cashing it because this is, I didn't do it. I didn't do direct deposit. I got this check from Google and it was just like the coolest thing, right? Like I just got a check from the internet <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, I almost didn't cash it in time because you had like 90 days to cash it. But that was also like this, like that sealed the deal. Like, okay, this is real. I know it's only $151, you know, I'm making about 10 grand a month for my financial planning practice. But like, that was like a bigger deal to me. And then it wasn't, uh, I think like five or six months later, got up to five grand and that's, so it was that. And then we'll fast forward just a little bit where recognizing that I wanted to do more podcasts. I wanted to do YouTube. I wanted to be on social media as, you know, as that's blowing up, but my compliance department, they just kept pushing back. And I, to the point where I got my hand slapped and it was because I think it was on Twitter. And they basically told me that I had to have everything pre-approved for social media, which I was already having all my blog posts pre-approved, right? Like that, I was already used to that process, but they were telling me like, so if I post something on Facebook, I had to have it pre-approved. And I'm, I have to share this example because it's this exact same, this is the exact thing I said to my compliance officer. I said, okay, so what you're telling me is that if I take my family to Applebee's on a Friday night and we get the all you can eat rib basket, and it's amazing. I want to share that on Facebook. I have to wait until Monday, submit that to compliance, wait three to five business days for you to approve it before I can post that to Facebook. And they were like, yes. And I'm like, okay, I'm done. And what I mean by done was like, I knew that I, there had to be another way because there were other advisors I was following on social media that seemed like they were saying whatever they wanted and they were an RIA, a registered investment advisory firm. And that's when I'm like, okay, I don't know how they did it, but like, I'm interested and curious how to find it out. And so that began the homework of figuring that out, dropping the Series 7 license, starting my own wealth management firm, having to repaper all my clients, which was also very interesting because I, I had to tell them because the only reason that I was doing it was because of the blog. Like there was no other business purpose having to repaper everybody. We weren't changing firms. It was still the same firm. We just had to like go from like, one division to the next. Um, it was, it was really interesting, but it was like totally worth it. And I remember that I ended up losing. There was, um, for those that don't know, like if you have certain type of accounts, whether it be like a share mutual funds, they'll, they'll pay a trail or 12B1 fee. And there were other type investments like that, like annuities that I had sold or had inherited that were also paying these trails. But if you have a series seven license, I'm sorry, if you don't have a series seven license, then you can't, you can't hold those anymore. So I think at the time, like it was almost like $40,000 in revenue that I was giving up by dropping the license and also recognizing that some client, like I had, I think two or three clients, even though it was like no different, they didn't come, which one was like totally fine. Like I was glad he didn't come, but it, it was like this other giant leap of faith. But I knew at that time, the reason was like, once again, talking to guys like Ryan and recognizing that there were affiliate you know, affiliate income or selling my own products that could be their sponsorship type deals that were on the other side. Um, I mean, I was hoping they were, nothing was guaranteed, but um, I'm trying to remember now, but like, I remember 
it was within 90 days. Like all the money that I had lost or given up, like was recouped and made back. And it was once again, like there's so many of these risk, uh, risk moments in my life that looking back, I mean, you can see where the income increase exponentially. And actually that's something I, I want to do a blog post and a YouTube video about, uh, just looking back at these different moments in my life, we're taking these big risks end up, and they weren't like, Hey, I'm going to like do this like tomorrow. You know, it was like, all right, I'm going to think this through, go through the pros and cons. And, but it still ended up being a great thing that worked out. So. So I want to fast forward to a tweet thread you had, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. Maybe it was this past week. So you talk about here, you're making like five grand in Google ads. This is like 90 days after you start implementing them. But then it sounds like you stacked on a whole lot of other passive or mostly passive income streams. You you mentioned you made $135,000 in one month. And we don't have to get into like every single dollar that came in, but obviously you started stacking on more income streams to that original Google AdSense that you threw up on the site back in the day. Could you talk about like as the progression, you can go as quickly or as slowly as you want through each of the income streams, but how did you start to like just stack and get a bigger and bigger passive income stream or passive income streams month over month over month from that point on? Getting up from five to 135K is absolutely nuts. <laughs> yeah, no, so a lot of that was, so I grew the site uh, and I tried hiring certain people. I tried contractors and bringing people on. And I got to a point where it was making about 16,000, I think, a month. And on top of the financial planning practice, which once again, like that, that's a pretty good side hustle. Like I was, I was very happy. And I remember I, I was, I ended up getting connected to this, uh, a guy who was like an SEO guy. And when he looked at like my site and just looked at like the whole backlink profile, um, and I, what I mean by that was there was for me as like an advisor, anytime I had the opportunity to write for like a Forbes or a business insider or an AOL, like I, I was, I was chasing after that media as seen on, which it's kind of cool. But what I didn't realize at the time was like, anytime I did that, I would get a backlink to my site. And what that did was increase the domain authority of the site. So anyway, he's looking at the site. And he's like, dude, you got links from like all these major sites that like most of the average person can't get unless you've got deep pockets and, and can buy them some way, somehow. And he's like, with the, the amount of links that you have to your site, like you should be making more than what you are now. Like you should make, be making like six figures. A month is what it, like he told me. And I'm like, I just retold me that and I laughed. I'm like, ha ha ha, you're funny. Uh, but then, you know, we ended up like working out a deal where like he helped me with the whole monetization side, which I just, I just don't like. It's just not me. Like it's just, that's like a full time job in itself. And it's something that just, I'm not passionate about because for me, it was always what, what type of content can I create to help somebody, you know, and to have to work, talk to different affiliate partners and do on page optimization and blah, 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 all that stuff. Like that just wasn't my, in my expertise. So basically it was just taking what I already had already built and bringing somebody else on a, an expert in that space to kind of help me. And it took, um, it didn't happen as fast as he said, but like, I think within like a year, I mean, it, it we got up to almost six figures. It might've been like 18 months where we finally got the six figures, but that was, not really doing anything different. Cause like I already had it, I already had the foundation built. It was just making a few tweaks uh, and contacting the right partners and just monetizing uh, different channels that basically turning on channels that we hadn't, I didn't even know could turn on uh, like selling different types of leads and stuff like that. So that's for me was like that reminder because I'm, I'm very much have like this military grunt personality of like, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and get it done. Right. Which is good uh, at times, but there's also times realizing like, okay, I could work 80 hours and I'm still not going to, I might make some progress, but I could also maybe just pay somebody that knows it a lot better than I do. It's probably more passionate about it and actually enjoys it. And it's a win-win for both parties. And that's in, what I end up doing is uh, hiring or partnering with this individual to help me in the areas that I just, I sucked at. And if somebody was out there like thinking about getting into blogging today or getting into the kind of the space today, obviously things change all the time, whether it's the algorithms or the ad or, you know, the revenue sharing or whatever it is, things change. But if somebody was getting into stuff today, 
what do you think are the things that you would recommend somebody focus on doing a little bit of that grunt work, like doing it themselves versus like what they should maybe lean on uh, outside expertise, maybe hire out. Like what would, what would you advise somebody who's getting started in something like that? Yeah, I think, you know, I think about, uh, you know, some of the, you, we mentioned that uh, we know like Grant Sabatier, you know, millennialmoney.com. He came onto the scene. I mean, I think like eight years, I forget, like after I did. And so we were all kind of like, who is this guy? <laughs> Cause he kind of came out of nowhere and all of a sudden, like, you know, he was ranking and he was, uh, just like a presence, you know, in the space. And when I think about him and even before him, there was like Mr. Money Mustache. Um, those are like, uh, who's, I can't think of her name now. Uh, my first 100 K. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm drawing Tori Dunlap. Tori Dunlap. Right. So you have what, what makes them unique is like, it's their, it's their story. You know, like it's their story. And whether it's a blog or a YouTube channel or TikTok or Instagram, people relate to the story. And if you're trying to rank for like best life insurance companies, best auto insurance, top investing uh, platforms or top investing apps, I mean, you're competing with, I mean, not only me, but like the nerd wallets and the money geeks and the money.coms of the world, CNN money, Forbes, US news, like, it's probably not going to happen. But if you have a unique story or you're on the, on the cusp of a unique story by, Hey, I'm a hundred thousand dollars of debt and this is my path of trying to pay it off. Then like, that's what somebody can rally around, rally around, excuse me. So that it's the story to me. It's the story. Can you tell a story? Can, can you be relatable you know, without selling your soul? And I think that's how, really anybody in this day and age can still start a blog or any sort of online platform and still do very well. Absolutely agree. You never know who's going to resonate with your voice either. Like someone could be the most experty expert as our friend Jillian Johnsford says, but someone might have a very similar story to you and they might connect with, with what you have to say, even if you're not the best or the smartest or the strongest, like you just have a unique perspective that other people can latch onto. I mean, I like to share something, and I think he would be okay with me saying this, but um, there's a guy, he's an older fellow, uh, older than me, but his name's Rob Berger, and he used to own doughroller.net, sold it, and uh, just at FinCon here recently. So he's been like, I think he was doing some consulting for the, the company that bought uh, his site out. He was still writing for Forbes, and then he started a YouTube channel, no editing, uh, he does like maybe one or two like talking hit type videos a week and he'll do like one weekly live Q and a, and he's been doing it for a few years, has like 70,000 subscribers. And at FinCon, like he told me this and actually I have his name written on my board because it's like a reminder of like, you can go out and you can do 72 different things and you might do very well, but you also will probably kill yourself in the process, which like I tend to, I, I, I've always considered myself a professional plate spinner. Like I just like love taking on more things, but I don't want to do that anymore. Like I did that. Back in the day, right? I've got four kids. I've got two puppies. Like, I don't have the time or the capacity or even the desire to do that. So, like, Rob, he does, like he said, that's what he does. He has his own personal blog and he said that he's making more money now than he was when he was running Dough Roller full time. Wow. And I'm like, okay, can you say that one more time? Um, because, but all he's doing and the reason, like, and I think like, people can learn from this is like, he's showing up. Like every single week, and there are a few weeks he doesn't show up. Like I saw like he had to cancel for whatever reason. But for the most part, like he's there, like I think it's like Monday evenings, right? He's like there for like 90 minutes showing up, answering people's Q&As. And that to me is like that consistency of just being there and being that resource for people, you know, when they, they're looking for that answer. And for him, I think it's our retirees that are really connecting to him right now. So it's like. Who who's your tribe? Who's your community that you can just be there and continually show up and, and, and be there, right? Like there, there's a way to, to monetize that. I think something really important that you've talked about and just a theme of this episode so far, and even going back to the very beginning, like talking about your parents, you know, everyone has the same 24 hours in the day. Even you, when you first started your blog, your brand, Jeff, you were making far less money than you are now, just because you made a few tweaks. You hired on, you partnered with an SEO guy. 
how do you focus on the right inputs? Because there are people who are working 16 hours a day, like as a house cleaner, who are just making ends meet. They're making like $12 an hour. There's someone who might be working an hour a week, making $10 million a year, just because they have focused on the right inputs. They've built the right system. So for those who are looking to like maximize the time that we have in the day, how do you go and identify <laughs> the right inputs to focus on so that you can build this kind of financial engine that runs in the background? Yeah, dude, that's a, a great question. And I think the easiest way I can answer that, it wasn't until I joined a coaching program called the Strategic Coach. Mm -hmm. And they walked us through several different things. But one of the first things you had to do before you even went to your first session was you had to take the Colby Index, which is like a personality test. And there's like Myers-Briggs, there's, there's some others, but Colby is like, it's, it's four numbers. And it basically is just to understand how you're wired. You know, it's just like everybody's wired differently. And with that, they helped you understand what your unique ability is. And so I think Dan Sullivan, the founder of Strategic Coach, defines unique ability as what is your God-given talent that you can, that you enjoy doing, that you can do night and day uh, and feel recharged, you know, re, uh, rejuvenated, and but also you get paid very well to do it. and. When you start to like start to define what that is, you know, so like then they'd have you like take a list of like write down everything that you do for the day, right? Have a little sheet of paper at your desk and just write down everything that you do and start looking at the things that you're doing, like occupying your time. And then for me, you know, like my little um, thermometer was like, okay, I'm in the, in the middle of doing something. And I want to kick my dog because I'm so angry or I'm so frustrated. Or if I end up saying out loud or to myself, why am I doing this? That is like the, the red flag. Like, okay, I need to remove this from my plate. And is this something that I can, am I at that space where I can hire somebody? Maybe I'm not there yet, but maybe there's some way that I can simplify this process. I mean, maybe I can, do something, right? Or at least take note of it. Or maybe just something like, I don't need to be doing this anymore. But I remember like, it's so silly looking back. Like one of the first things I was doing in my financial planning practice was like, I was still scheduling client appointments. And it just one of these things, I'm like, why am I doing this? Because that's just what I did when I first started. It was just one of those things. It was just part of my day. Like, oh yeah, I'm going to call so-and-so and book that appointment. And then it's like, why? That's like 15, 20 minutes of, of time, not, not only like having to like stop this and like, you know, move on to this task and everything else. So it's just one of those things, this, this constant pruning of your tasks. Like one of the things I still do, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually ashamed. I'm still admitting, like I've, I still get angry at this, but, um, I don't publish YouTube videos frequent enough at the current moment to justify this, but like, I still do my YouTube thumbnails. And every time I do it, I'm in that space of like, why am I doing this? I need to find somebody. But I'm like, I'm only published. I like, I think I published like one video in the last month. So like, I just don't have that go-to person yet. But like, that's the one thing that keeps coming up for me. It's like, I do not need to be wasting my time. There's somebody else out there that loves graphic design, that loves tweaking YouTube thumbnails. Like, I know they're out there. I just have to spend some time trying to find them. Yeah, that's a that's a great point about like, you know, if you find yourself in that moment, being like, why am I doing this? You know, and also <laughs> just running everything like a business and thinking about like, what the effort that I'm putting in, what's the gain that I'm getting out. But we were talking about, you know, pruning things like getting things off your plate. But I'm curious, because most of the time, people like yourself who are constantly looking for these different things, they've got something new coming down the pipe, they've got something that they're excited about in the future, some new thing that they're spinning up. So what's uh, what's next for Jeff? Mm, um. Well, I like to answer that a little bit differently because I, I, I will answer that, but I also like to say that what you just shared there is like that shiny object syndrome where oftentimes like we're working on something, we feel like that we are 100% focused and all of a sudden you get that text, you get that email, uh, you get that DM from Twitter and all of a sudden like there's this unique, amazing opportunity that presents itself. And I used to be really, really guilty of like, getting really excited about all these different things and just want to like jump in all in, you know, like, but I, I really, what really helped me was having clear set goals um, where, where you're doing not only your lifetime goals, but having your three-year goals, having your one-year goals and having your 90 day goals and then your monthly goals and then your weekly goals. And this all came from the strategic coaching program. 
And that really helped me when I could actually see, all right, this is what I'm working on. Like, this is what I'm excited about. And when this opportunity would come up that somebody would present, it just look at this and like, Ooh, man, that sounds really, really cool. But like, I already got a lot of cool stuff going on. So it, it gave me this freedom to say maybe not so much no, but not right now. And that was like a big deal for me because like anytime I said no, it felt like I was losing my soul. Right. I mean, it just felt like, but this is such a great opportunity. Like, oh my gosh, like th this is going to do so much amazing things. Forgetting in that moment, like, man, I've got a lot of other amazing things working out. So, um, so yeah, like that is one of the things. And I don't know if that was a good segue, but like, that's why I, I have this course that I'm in the process of le uh, releasing right now. And it all came from strategic coach, you know, like, cause that program, I think at back then it was like 9,000. I think it's like 10 to 12,000. Now I also did another online program, uh, Todd Herman's 90 day year, which is an amazing program. I think it was like $3,500. And I've always been that guy, right? Like is I, I look at myself at the, the 19 year old version of me that I think I read Rich Dad Poor Dad by then, somewhere around that time frame, but knew that there was like something bigger here, right? Like I, seeing my parents struggle with their finances and just wanting something different, but also recognizing like, man, I was broke. <laughs> uh, I didn't have any money back then. I was, I was like donating plasma just to like have some like going out money back in the day. <laughs> So having this program, like I didn't want to charge like $10,000. I didn't want to charge $3,500. I wanted to have something that was available to that 19, 20 year old version of myself that just knows there's something bigger out here, but like, I just don't have the financial means to do so. Uh, so just making that available for like those. And I know like a lot of people tell me, Oh no, you need to charge more. Cause I can target financial advisors and charge a hundred times more than what I'm going to pay. But like, to me, like, that's just not, that's just not who God's told me to, to help and as, as best I can. So love that, man. Well, you've certainly helped millions at this point, despite the hundreds, the very ambitious goal <laughs> of helping a couple hundred people when you first started out. And for those listeners who want to keep up with all the cool stuff you have going on, you mentioned you're a, a quite the plate spinner yourself. Where do you want to direct people to follow along, keep in touch and get all that good financial information? Yeah, so the the blog that's home based that's goodfinancialsense dot com. You can check me out on YouTube. You can search Jeff Rose or Wealth Hackers YouTube channel. And right now, social media, Twitter is like where I'm most active, and that's at J Jeff Rose Two Js. You can help find me there, and also Instagram with the same handle. Jeff, thank you so much for giving us some time. Like Cody said, we're glad uh, you ended up reaching a little more than a hundred people, and we're glad <laughs> to get to highlight that story today. So thank you for giving us some time. Yeah, no, thank you.